Thank you. This has been a truly wonderful meeting. Back in 1967, at the end of my tenure as president of Sigma Phi Sigma, there, the, there was a decision made between uh, the officer of Sigma Phi Sigma and the director of the American Institute of Physics it would be a good idea to merge Sigma Phi Sigma and, thank you, and the uh, American Institute of Physics student section. The director of AIP could do this just by saying we do it. Sigma Phi Sigma has in its constitution and bylaws the fact that if we ever wanted to do something like this, it had to be approved at a national meeting of representatives of Sigma Phi Sigma. This was done in Purdue. I, it was late in 1967. I was, as being president, I was the, I suppose, master of ceremonies, the guy who stood up in front and tried to keep the meeting into, under control. Uh, it was the hardest work I ever did in my life. <laughs> we started out with, I think most of the representatives that had come there were going to vote no on this because there had been some conflict between the AIP student sections and Sigma Phi Sigma. I was convinced that the future of Sigma Phi Sigma really would, be, would benefit from such a merger. Maybe this showed up in what I said, I don't know. But at the end, there was a vote, and it was 12 to 2. There were times after that that I had real serious misgivings. I helped to make this merger and was it really good for Sigma Phi Sigma? I don't imagine there is a person in this room that is more appreciative than I am of this particular meeting, because it says you were not wrong. It is very, very it was a very good move as far as Sigma Phi Sigma is concerned. And from what I've heard, talk, heard in talking with people that are representatives of the AIP, Sigma Phi Sigma is good right now, and it's going to get better as the years go on. I do enjoy this, I have thoroughly enjoyed this meeting until just a few minutes ago. <laughs> the dinner was a particularly good dinner. Maybe I ate too much. What may start out as pearls of wisdom turn out as burps of gas, for which I <laughs> I want to also ask your help. I'm older than I like to admit. And as you get older, there is a thing which elder, older people refer to as senior moments. And what they mean by this, maybe some of you are having senior moments uh, at earlier ages. So what it, what it means is that you want to say something that you know what it is. And so help me, the electrical connection in your brain simply is turned off for a short interval. You hope it is temporary. And these are what are called temporary, or called senior moments. And it happens particularly in terms of names of individuals. I know my wife's name, and I think I could come up with it in an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> there is a story about this. Two elderly friends were talking. One of them said, I'm embarrassed. I've known you for eight years, and I cannot think of your name. And the other fellow looks at him, and there's a pause. Finally, the other fellow says, how soon do you need to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'm going to talk about are experiences that I had at Los, Al Los Alamos and down at Trinity uh, for the, in the original explosion and 30 days later. Uh, if I have one of these senior moments, I can't think of a person's name, please help me out. I went to Los Alamos from, from the University of Wisconsin, where I was a graduate student, in, 19, in the spring of 1944. And in 1944, there was real serious worry that we might be defeated by the German uh, military organization. And it wasn't in terms as Rommel was doing very well in, in Africa. There were other things that were very bad as far as our situation in World War II. But the things that some of us knew about 
In other words, the nuclear possibility of nuclear weapons. The basic idea was that there was proof. We knew that the Germans were working on some nuclear aspect. They, they were uh, trying to accumulate heavy water. And the only, pur only purpose anybody knew for heavy water in those days was to use as a moderator to slow neutrons down, which you need to do if you're going to build a reactor and prove the possibility of a chain reaction. It, when Hahn and Strauss, well, first of all, all of the business of atomic energy, either whether it's peaceful or military, has basically came about by accident. Because in 1932, Shadwick came up with the idea of a neutron. And the reason he came up with the idea for a neutron was that there were a half a dozen things known in physics where there were serious discrepancies of, uh, that simply couldn't be explained. If you, well, I, won't, I don't have time to go into the details. But when Shadwick came up with this concept of a particle whose mass was roughly the mass of a photon, and it had no, no electric charge, this had some real serious consequences. One of them was that this appeared to be a very good uh, particle to be used as a projectile to shoot into other nuclei to get <coughs> nuclear reactions. Why do you want to shoot, up, shoot particles into other nuclei? Well, the experimental nuclear physicist is like a man who wants to know what's inside a, a certain hen house. And if, you top, if the hen house happens to be atoms of material high up in the periodic char chart, they are radioactive. And out of these, these materials come particles that are called alphas and betas and gammas. If you talk about nuclei, which are, say, gold or further down in the periodic chart, uh, nothing comes out. So this business of observing what comes out to try to figure out what's on the inside doesn't work. So in those circumstances, if the things that are inside the hen house don't want to come out, you get grandpa's shotgun and you put a load of buckshot into the hen house. <laughs> and the buckshot will interact with the particles that are in there. <laughs> and under those circumstances, they will come out. <laughs> the particles that were used for nuclear bombardment in those days were protons and electrons. Uh, these were accelerated by electromagnetic means through by devices like the Cockroft fault machine, the Van de Graaff generator, the cyclotron, uh, later the Betatron, and so forth. If you're going to bombard the hen house to get things to come out, you don't want the buckshot you use to be too much bigger than the hen house itself. <laughs> <laughs> it makes for slight, slight uh, indelicacy in the results of the experiment. And so this is why they use nuclear particles, like protons and electrons, to shoot into them. There's a problem there. Particular, uh, the electrons have, have very little mass. And so they do not cause as much disruption inside the hen house as the protons do. Protons are preferred for most nuclear reactions. There is a problem. The nuclei you're shooting protons into have a positive electric charge. And the protons have a positive electric charge. And as they approach, there is a very high probability that due to the Coulomb repulsion, the proton won't get into the nucleus. And oh boy, here is a particle with a mass of the proton, or a little bit greater, and it has no electric charge, and you ought to be able to shoot them in the nuclei very, very well. When you do shoot these, proton, these uh, neutrons into another nucleus, let's suppose you talk about an aluminum 27 nucleus, which has 13 protons and 14 neutrons in it. Aluminum 27, it is a 100% isotope for aluminum. And you shoot a proton, or neutron in there, and suddenly, in this nucleus, for a short time, you have what we call a compound nucleus. And you have the original 13 protons, and you now have 15 neutrons in there. And this neutron came in with a certain amount of kinetic energy. And it also gives up some binding energy when it comes in. And the result is that the particles in there have a terrific amount of kinetic energy. Fermi referred to this as the nuclear furnace, that the things are just charging, charging around. And the nucleus, like everything else in, in, in nature, 
if it has a system has a certain amount of energy and it somehow can reduce its energy, it will do so. If you don't believe this, take a brick and hose over your toe and let go of it. <laughs> and uh, you'll find that this is the situation. There was a young man in, in Rome who said, let's do something important. Well, first of all, the neutron going in, the compound nuclear, has to get rid of this energy. And it can get rid of it in many different ways. A neutron can come back out. A proton can come out. An alpha particle can come out. An electron come out. And when they start looking at these various nuclear reactions, the thing that seemed to be the most prolific was the electron coming out, the so-called N-beta reaction. A neutron goes in, you get a compound nucleus, and one of the, one of the in aluminum, uh, one of the 15 neutrons in there disintegrates into a proton plus an electron. And the proton is held in the nucleus, and the electron comes out. This is the N-beta reaction. It seemed to be the most prolific reaction. And when that happens, of course, you no longer have aluminum because the positive shock, the introduction of an, you now have an extra proton. You don't have 13 protons in there. You've got 14 protons. And that means it's no longer silicon, or no longer aluminum. It's silicon. There was a man, and everybody would start bombarding neutrons into everything. In fact, when I went to Wisconsin, you, they, I was told that you were you're getting there a little bit too late. The days of bombarding ketchup and getting mustard out have gone by. You have to do more delicate experiments now. <laughs> but there was a young man in Rome who said, let's do something important. Let's take the element which is at the top of the periodic table, uranium, and let's bombard it with neutrons, and a, an electron will come out, and we'll get element 93, which has never been seen on Earth. How do you determine that you've produced element 93? Uranium, like all the things up at the top of the periodic chart, are radioactive. And any, any uh, nucleus up there at the top has a definite <coughs> signature. What comes out, what the energy of it is that comes out. So the idea is, let's shoot neutrons into uranium. Uranium has several different isotopes, but most of it is primarily uranium-238. So we'll shoot neutrons in, uh, and electrons will come out, and we will have element 93. How will we recognize that? This is a new nuclear species, and it will have a new identi identification. Probably it'll kick out alpha particles, most of them up there do, but uh, <coughs> the energy certainly is going to be different. So this is what he did. And after bombarding the uranium uh, target for some time, you look for radioactive uh, particles coming out, how, what their energy, uh, if you can determine what the half-life is and so forth, you, can find, you would expect to find a new radioactive identification. And he did that happen. The trouble was there wasn't just one. There wasn't just seven. There were, I don't know whether there were hundreds or not, but there were many, many new radioactive disintegrations. And he thought, explained this by saying, well, element 93 was formed, and it got bombarded by a neutron, and that formed element 94. And some of the element 94 got, got hit by neutrons, and that formed element 95. And these were the so-called transuranic elements. But there was a woman chemist in, in Berlin who, did, I don't know what, what she didn't like about the experiment, but she said, what actually has happened, that this uranium nucleus, in, in when it is, a compound nucleus has been formed, and this energy, the energy it has is so great that it has been split into two fragments. And as such, there then would be radioactive material. And these, if you look at the uh, ratio of neutrons to protons and uranium, and you look at those for elements that are near the middle of the periodic chart, you will find that the uranium has a much higher percentage of neutrons than do the things down in the middle of the periodic chart. Well, the result, and also, I have always heard that Lisa Meitner, uh, a theoretical physicist who was then, in, I believe, in Denmark, uh, was apparently used the semi-empirical mass formula that was known at that time because 
there were no values of the uh, masses of these new nuclei that were being formed in the middle of the periodic chart. She used this and she calculated the Q value of one of these fission reactions. And you come out with about approximately 200 MeV. Also, there are more neutrons than really uh, can be handled. And uh, prediction was that there would be some free neutrons come out also. Now, 200 MeV is, is in nuclear terms is a tremendous amount of energy. But in terms of uh, uh, macroscopic things, put it in the palm of your hand, and I don't know whether you feel it or not, I really doubt that you would. But if you can make that happen, say 10 to the 24th time, 10 to the 27th time, like we do when we say take an a average, gasoline, average molecule of gasoline and completely oxidize it, and I'm told that the energy that you get out of that is the order of two or three electron volts. And then that energy from the uh, first molecule goes into causing other molecules to oxidize and so forth. So there is a method of going from the first, act, first event to many, many, many more. And if, for instance, you wanted to think about uh, the relative energy that you're going to get from somehow making the fission process on a macroscopic scale, compare that to what you would get if you, say, took half a bucket of gasoline and completely oxidized it. How can you completely oxidize it? Well, fill the bucket half full and then fill the top half of it with liquid oxygen and then light a match to it. <laughs> the building will go away. This is perforate rocket fuel. <laughs> so now we are talking about something, if you can make it on, happen on a macroscopic scale, is the order of a hundred million times of some and ener, hundred million times as energetic as rocket fuel. And this is a tremendous source of energy. I was under the impression that Lisa Meitner was the one who really published all or put, put out all this information. If you look, at, as I did recently, you look under, on Google for fission, <coughs> you will find that the AIP has furnished a, a website there that describes quotations of many, many famous physicists that existed at that time. The only one that I can think of right now is John Dunning, but they were, there was a large, great number of them. And every one of them, well, first of all, that was something I omitted and is critical. In 1938, Hahn and Strassmann in Germany repeated uh, the experiments of Fermi, and they conclusively found the existence of barium in the byproducts. And the only way this could happen, if the barium could have existed, was the fission process had occurred. And the AIP uh, program shows, it quotes, the statements made by many, many prominent physicists of what they, their feeling was when they learned of uh, Hahn and Strassmann's work. They're not talking about Lisa Meitner. They're talking about when they learned about Hahn and Strassmann. And almost every one of them realizes there's a tremendous energy source there. They also, re also realize that there are going to be these free ne neutrons. And so there is a possibility that you have a uh, uranium nucleus, and you shoot a proton into it, the most probable thing that will happen is it goes right on through and nothing happens. But occasionally, uh, it will form a compound nucleus, and you will produce fission, and you'll get several neutrons. And if one of these several neutrons, say of the order of three, can go then hit another uranium nucleus, and that can put out three, and so forth, this uh, means the uh, possibility of a chain reaction. Now, if you take a very small chunk of uranium, say something the size of a pea, and let's, uh, following the work that the theoretical work that, that uh, John Wheeler and Neil Bohr had done, where they thought of the uranium nucleus hit by a neutron as a liquid drop, and the energy goes into causing oscillations in the liquid drop, and when the oscillations get big enough, like an amoeba, it will separate into two parts, and that separation and the liquid drop picture is what we call fission. If, uh, so there, there, Neil Bohr came to the United States. He, he was just ready to leave Denmark 
when Lisa Meitner and Otto Frisch told, had, had, Lisa Meitner had learned from her German uh, co uh, colleagues about the work of Hans Strassmann. And they, apparently they, they did not want to tell this to Bohr because Bohr was just ready to leave by ship to the United States and they knew he would, so would cancel his trip and stay home and work on it. And what the story I have heard is they waited until he was on board ship and the whistle had blown for all non-passengers to get off. And they quickly told him about it and they figured that he would not have time to get his, his luggage off of the ship and he wouldn't leave without his luggage. So he was trapped on the ship with this knowledge. And he thought about it all, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And when he got here, he first talked to Fermi, who was in this country, and some other people. And he gave a talk in Washington, D.C. I think it was in January of uh, 39, but I won't guarantee that. And he described all of these ideas about the possible energy source, the possibility of a chain reaction. And when Niels Bohr talks, even back then, people listen. He may be hard to understand, but what he says is important. And people got up and left the audience while he was talking. These were primarily people from John Hopkins University. They wanted to get back to their laboratory because if this, this large energy release was available, even on a single atomic scale, boy, it ought to show up in ionization chambers or Geiger counters and should be very easily measured. And they wanted to be the first ones to measure this. They were not the first ones to measure it. Otto Frisch did back in, in Denmark, but uh, they did by, they figured out that Frisch was going to publish his work in Nature magazine. They knew when Nature came out. They looked around for another scientific journal, which was published went on, on the stand the day before Nature in Comparendu in France, Pittsville. They wired the, the results of their experiment where they had seen these large vision pulses. And they were the first ones to publish the experimental evidence of the vision process. Well, in 1944, in the spring of 44, I went down to Los Alamos. I was assigned to a group using the two Van de Graaff generators that the previous year had been sent down there uh, at, uh, from the University of Wisconsin. John Williams, <coughs> professor from Minnesota, was our group leader. The basic problem we had, am I getting away from the microphone? The basic problem we had was to see if it was possible for a uh, critical mass of uh, either plutonium or uranium-235 could be formed. Now there's always the possibility that some other nuclear reactions that we weren't aware of uh, could occur on a macroscopic scale and extract and cut down on the number of neutrons that were being made on a secondary scale. So there was a possibility that it would be physically impossible to make a nuclear explosive. We didn't believe that, but with this is something that had to be checked. And these nuclear reactions, you, you can't make just one measurement at one neutron energy. They are dependent, their the probability that they will occur are dependent upon what the energy of the neutron is. So with two Van, at Los Alamos at that time, with two Van de Graaff generators, with a Cockroft Walton machine, and with a cyclotron, uranium-235 and plutonium-239 were being bombarded by neutrons, and the probability of the interactions of the various kinds were being measured. And with this information, it was, we would hope to calculate how much material would be necessary for a critical mass. Now, a critical mass, you can read, you can figure out what has to happen. If you have a very small amount of uranium or plutonium-239 and you shoot a neutron in, the most probable thing is happening is it will right on go on through. But if it hits one nucleus, well, then it forms some secondary nucleus, and if it's a small quantity, they will escape, and nothing will happen. So to avoid that, you start putting greater and greater amounts of nuclei, that, of either the 235, or the plutonium, and as it gets bigger and bigger, you're going to get to a certain size where, on the average, one of the three secondary neutrons is going to cause another fission. 
and then one of those three is going to cause another one. And when that happens, then you can get a macroscopic explosion. And this is what we call a critical mass. I heard Richard Feynman give a colloquium. Incidentally, going to Los Alamos for a young graduate student in nuclear physics was, a, was essentially a paradise. Uh, the people you got to work with, people you had heard of, uh, it, it, it just was unbelievably good. I heard Richard Feynman, which is one of those people, give a colloquium talk. And I, I, I don't remember all he said, but one of the things he said was, what will happen if we accidentally get a critical mass of either uranium or plutonium together? What are we going to lose? We're going to lose a beaker. We're going to lose a laboratory room. We're going to lose the eastern half of New Mexico. <laughs> and at that time, nobody really knew. <laughs> well, at first I was there doing, helping to run the experiment where we bombarded two, uranium-235 and plutonium with neutrons of different energies. Van de Graaff generators are very nice in terms of being able to control the energy of the neutrons coming out. But then the time came, I still remember the first time I saw a gram and a half of plutonium. It was in a glass bottle, and that bottle was in another bottle, and that bottle was in another bottle, and this was held by a major general. And I didn't notice it at that time, but there was a major general, or behind the major general, there must have been a guy with a snub-nosed 38 revolver. Not in a holster, but in his hand. Because any time you had more than 19 milligrams of plutonium, you had one of these security guards assigned to you. And you, if you knew what to look for, they could be in civilian clothes or army clothes, but they had that snub nose 38 in their hand. And it was their duty to either keep their eye on the plutonium or its immediate container. And they weren't kidding one bit. The first time I ran into one of these people, uh, we had set up our equipment to measure what we call the multiplication ratio that we would get out of, out of plutonium. Basically, the experiment consisted of having a one-inch diameter sphere, which had a mixture of various materials in it, so that it gave off neutrons. And the energy of these neutrons were roughly 3 MeV, 3.2 MeV, which was the energy of the neutrons that come out on the average from the fission of uh, plutonium. I was the first one to get to the laboratory that particular morning, as far as I knew. And I walked over the equipment, and there was a uh, dark, deep voice behind me that says, will you please stand still? And I don't know what your reaction is. You turn around and look at who made this comment, and you're looking at a funnel-shaped 38 revolver. And he wasn't kidding one damn bit. <laughs> Furthermore, he didn't need the gun. He was an ex-professional wrestler. <laughs> he had been Fermi's personal guard before Fermi came down to, to Los Alamos. Very nice guy. In the ensuing nights, well, first of all, I was one of a three-man team that was trying to measure the critical mass of plutonium. We had this source, and we had two counters out here about, oh, 18 inches apart from the source. These were so-called long counters. They were the, the best thing we had for measuring neutrons independent of the neutron energy. If you make a plot of the efficiency of a neutron of a long counter down at around 29 keV, which is the lowest neutron energy we could get to, if you talk up, you get a curve which looks like this. If you talk about the top being 100%, you went from about 97% at 30 keV up to 100%, and out of 10 MeV, which is about how far as we could go, you, are, you get 98% efficiency. So we felt that the, the counters are essentially independent of the efficiency of the counters. And we had these two big counters here, and we put this source here, and believe me, in weeks of work, we knew how many neutrons per second were coming out of that little one-inch sphere. And then comes the day when there is enough plutonium, has come, which has come down from Hanford, Washington, that they have cast it into two hemispherical shells. And these would be placed around the one inch diameter uh, source. And so what we're looking for is we know how many neutrons per second the source puts out. 
if we are getting fission in the plutonium, we will get more neutrons. And this, thus we can calculate a thing called the multiplication factor. And the multiplication factor on that first uh, attempt where these shells were about an eighth of an inch in diameter, or in thickness, was 1.0. We just weren't getting appreciable non-multiplication. So the plutonium was taken back to Metallurgical Laboratory at Los Alamos, mainline time, more stuff has come down, and they, we come in a few days, it comes back again, and maybe it's a quarter of an inch thick. And we repeat this experiment. And this time, we can see that we are getting more neutrons out of this than we're getting just directly from the shell itself. So we plot the, we start plotting the multiplication uh, factor as a function of the thickness of the shell that we put around. And we expect this thing to asymptotically go up. We do not want to go clear to the top of this asymptote <laughs> because that's, that's when the thing explodes. <laughs> it was soon realized that plotting an, asymp as an asymptotic curve is a little bit difficult, especially if you're going to get close. <laughs> so we started plotting one over the multiplication factor. And that curves down, and you can, you can get awfully close to zero, and you can extrapolate to zero. And this is what we did. We repeated this experiment many times. We, the last, last time we did, we had 98% of the plutonium that was uh, detonated down at uh, Trinity. We were not permitted to do the 100% thing. <laughs> uh, the reason was our laboratory was up on the main level of Los Alamos, the town of Los Alamos. And they, they had duplicated our laboratory in a deep canyon. I think it is Omega Canyon, and I think it is the canyon that, that the bridge goes over at Los Alamos. It's a very deep canyon. If there would be an accident, they hoped that the explosion might be funneled upward and the town would go. The man who was in charge of this was a fellow named Louis Slogan. Louis was a very competent nuclear physicist, and he was also a very, uh, I would say, brave individual. When Fermi did his experiment under the uh, uh, field, the football field or soccer field, whatever it was, in uh, at, at uh, Chicago, there was a platform, up above, a wooden platform, and there were several men up there with buckets of cadmium sulfate. And if the things got out of control, they were to dump the cadmium sulfate onto the uh, reactor uh, pile. Uh, Louis was a very competent and brave individual, and he was in charge of the 100% measurement. Meanwhile, when we finished, well, incidentally, one thing I forgot to mention. I was a member of the three-man team that did this particular experiment. I was the low man on the total pole, and I can prove that. Uh, having a senior moment. <laughs> first, first name is Alan, I can't think of his name. He right. was in charge of, of the experiment. Had the, he ran the experiment from 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. And Carl Bailey, who was the graduate student, a little older than I was, was the second man, and he ran it from 4 p.m. to midnight, and I had the midnight to 8 a.m. shift. <laughs> that tells where you are in, in such an organization. Well, we ran it up to 98%, and then it was taken down to uh, Slotin's group, took it over, and did 100% 100, 100, uh, measurement. One, before we got to the 98%, and I think it was about when we had 98%, I had one horrible night. See, by this time, the, what you did was you had two shells that you put around the source. And by this time, these two shells were giving you a sphere about like this, about the size of what we consider as a, a softball. Um, these, plutonium is a very nasty stuff. In those days, it was felt that a microgram in your lungs should be surgically removed, and we, we believe this. Uh, you don't have chunks of plutonium that you handle with your hands, because plutonium oxidizes like mad. Uh, a clean-cut piece of plutonium in, in an ordinary air atmosphere will turn gold and brown, brown, black, and begin to flake off. 
you do not want to break, bleed these plates. So the material, all the plutonium we had were coated with a thin layer of metal. I think it was silver, but I'm not sure. This silver also stopped the alpha particles that were given off by the plutonium. One night, uh, I think was when we had the two biggest hemispheres. About 2.30 in the morning, I dropped the darn thing. <laughs> uh, when I dropped it, the piece, uh, the bottom piece fell off of the, the device that was holding it, fell about six inches onto a steel table that we had there. The other one I caught about a foot from the floor. I don't know what you do when you're scared. I mean, really scared. <laughs> I want to throw up. <laughs> I very quickly checked with an alpha counter, and there were no alphas coming through the... Well, first of all, the piece I caught was not damaged. The other piece had a dent in the side, and the two pieces would not go back together. <laughs> also, the, and on that dent, was the question was, was the silver coating damaged? Or was plutonium getting into the air? And checking with an alpha counter quite quickly, I couldn't find any alphas, so I presumed that the uh, silver coating had followed in shape, the, the change in shape in the plutonium. Incidentally, plutonium is soft like gold. That's why it had this big dent in the side. I didn't ask anybody. I should have. I didn't ask anybody. But I told the security guard to stay there, which he darn well was going to do. Uh, and I went, went to, we had a key that led us into a big warehouse next to our laboratory. I got a brand new ball peen hammer and I got a gas mask. And came back and took the hammer and gently tapped it back into shape. <laughs> Two or three taps, you check for alphas. <laughs> I had a presumably rather nervous guard over there, but he took <laughs> I actually got the thing so that the two pieces would go back together and continue the experiment. I think we maybe lost an hour. And when our, our group leader came back, Al Hansen, whose name I couldn't remember, uh, I told him what had happened and I went home and went to bed. <laughs> I came back on at midnight the next night and about 2.30 in the morning, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer walks in, <laughs> and uh, I certainly knew who he was, and I had an, an unhappy feeling that maybe he had heard my name. Or <laughs> <laughs> we talked for a few minutes, and I remember his final statement was, we are exceedingly fortunate you were so successful. <laughs> well, that was the... the material was turned over to parameters. Uh, while we were doing that experiment, uh, I wasn't involved with any other experiment. When that experiment was done, I, I was essentially free. I'm trying to think where I go next. Uh, oh, about... <coughs> Four days later, I came back from lunch at noon, and Dr. Hugh Richards, who was in our group, uh, said, Fermi wants you to call him. Call him. Fermi was known as the Pope of Los Alamos. <laughs> and I made a remark, I presume God's after me too. <laughs> I, I really didn't believe him. And he said, no, the man wants you to call him on the telephone. And again, scared, yes. Uh, I called him, he asked me to come up to his office. Now the point was, of the three of us that worked on it, two, got, two of them were down here at the Trinity site working there, and I was the only one left that had done worked on this experiment, and he wanted some details of the experiment. I went up there, I, I was scared to death, no question about it. Uh, after about five minutes, I realized that he was asking questions very gently, trying to get me at ease so we could carry on an intelligent conversation. Fermi <laughs> became one of the, my, my best beloved individuals at that particular instant. And we talked about 10 or 15 minutes, and suddenly in the doorway is Louis Slocum. Louis doesn't say a word. He goes over the blackboard and writes six point, and I think it was 6.47, but I, 
I will not guarantee those last two numbers. I know it was six. And there wasn't any permit. Louis didn't say anything. Fermi didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. We knew that he had measured the 100% critical mass, and this was the critical mass of two solid hemispheres of plutonium. This is what was necessary to make a nuclear explosion. This was the material that was sent down to Trinity. Well, I think it was a day or two after that, we got a call, telephone call from uh, our director, who was also down at Trinity. And he said he had a very dirty job for five people. And if there were five people in the group that were stupid enough to come down, he would put us to work. We were to bring all of the good four-wheel drive vehicles with us that we could. Well, you can imagine the dirty jobs, they'd have to be awful dirty to keep you away from there. And there were more, I don't know, there were probably 12 of us in that particular group, and there was a drawing of straws. And I was exceedingly lucky to be one of the ones that got the short straw. I was asked to go over to the technical motor pool and check out, I can't remember whether it was four or five, good quality four-wheel drive vehicles. And I soon found the tech sergeant that was in charge of the motor, the tech motor pool. I told him what I, what I wanted, and he just laughed in my face. He said, we used to have a large quantity of good four-wheel drive vehicles. For some reason, they're all being siphoned off someplace down in southern New Mexico. And all I've got left that I can give you is one Jeep and two four-by-four four, four four weapons carriers. He says, they're in bad shape. I'll give you some steel cables, so if you break down, you can haul, uh, haul them some distance. <laughs> I've never driven a Jeep since I was the one who had accumulated the vehicle. Uh, I put myself in the Jeep. It had no windshield. The only instrument that worked on it was the uh, batter, battery charging meter. Oil pressure gauge didn't work. Uh, temperature gauge didn't work. And that afternoon, uh, we started out. Since the speedometer didn't work on the Jeep, I was to drive in between the two weapons carriers, and I figured that they would stick with the, war with the wartime speed limit of 40 mile 45 miles an hour. I didn't know until later that we averaged 55 miles an hour down there. We were told to go through Albuquerque, go so many miles further, and look for a square sign about so big with a letter Y on it. And 50 yards beyond that, there would be two tracks going off in the desert. And we're to turn off there, and we will come to a checkpoint. And this is what we did. Now, this was, this was oh, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night, something like this. The checkpoint came when we were suddenly illuminated by an aircraft spotlight, uh, uh, beacon light. And silhouetted in the beacon light was a three-man team behind a tripod on a machine gun. And they obviously wanted us to stop. <laughs> Fortunately, we had the materials. Or they